Ever wondered, what it truly feels like to be robbed of freedom, to endure unimaginable hardships, and to endure against formidable challenges for the sake of survival? Well my friends, today we are diving into the emotional roller coaster that is the 2013 masterpiece, 12 Years a Slave. This film is based on the true story of Solomon Northup, a free African-American man, who is abducted, and sold into slavery in the pre-Civil War of United States. The movie follows Solomon's harrowing experiences, as he struggles to survive and maintain his dignity, while enduring the brutal and dehumanizing conditions of slavery. It's a poignant and thought-provoking exploration of the dark chapter in American history, shedding light on the atrocities of slavery, and the resilience of the human spirit. The movie starts with a group of people, who are forced to cut sugar cane, as slaves. There is a man sitting lazily on a wagon, watching them work. The scene changes to a group of small houses, where the slaves live. They are having a meal. Solomon Northup, one of the slaves, notices the dark juice of blackberries, and tries to make ink and a pen from it, but it doesn't work. Later, in the crowded place where the slaves stay, a woman tries to engage in a sexual act with Solomon, while he is sleeping. Solomon remembers happier times with his wife and children, and then we see glimpses of his life when he was a free man. He was a skilled violin player, and well known in his hometown, Saratoga. One night, after putting his children to bed, he talks with his wife, who is a cook. They playfully talk about him missing her cooking. The next morning, he sees his family off in a carriage. Later that day, he meets a friend who introduces him to two men, Brown and Hamilton, claiming to work for a circus-like show. They offer him a lot of money, to go with them to Washington DC, and promise to bring him back, before his wife returns. Solomon agrees and joins them. The next scene shows them at a restaurant in DC, where his patrons give him more money, than promised. They drink wine together, and suddenly, Solomon wakes up in a dark cell, chained to the floor. Through flashbacks, we see his so-called friends, taking him to his hotel room, pretending he's drunk. Brown insists that they need to finish things quickly. The flashback ends, and we see Solomon in the cell, being told that he is considered a runaway Georgia slave, despite his claims of being a free man, without any papers. Solomon is brutally beaten, and eventually thrown into a slave pen with others. Solomon talks to Clemens, a seemingly educated slave, who warns him about the seriousness of their situation. Soon, a mother named Eliza, and her daughter, are brought to the slave pen, joining a previously captured son. Eliza tries to stay strong, despite knowing the tragedy ahead. During the night, they are taken from their cell, chained, and transported to a river boat, filled with other enslaved people. Clemens advises Solomon to keep a low profile, and hide his ability to read and write. They meet another slave, named Robert, who suggests revolting and taking over the ship, but they choose caution. Later that night, a slaver visits the hold, and rapes Eliza. Robert tries to intervene, but is stabbed and killed. Clemens and Solomon are tasked with disposing of the body, in the river. As they reach a dock, Clemens's master awaits, demanding the return of his stolen property. Clemens, eager to please, abandons his previously displayed intelligence and goes back to his master, leaving Solomon without his only friend. After disembarking, a slaver named Freeman, calls out their names, but when he calls Solomon, as Platt, Solomon denies recognizing the name, and gets slapped for it. Freeman's cruel treatment of his slaves, is evident as they are forced to bathe naked, in buckets at his offices. Inside, he enthusiastically pitches his slaves to eager customers. A refined plantation owner named Ford, shows interest in Solomon and Eliza. Eliza pleads for him to take her children too, but Freeman heartlessly sells her son to another buyer. Ford tries to buy Eliza's daughter, but Freeman refuses to lower the price. Ford can only afford to purchase two of them. Eliza, devastated, screams in grief, disrupting the sale. Solomon is ordered to play the fiddle to lighten the mood. Ford takes his newly acquired slaves back to his plantation. Eliza continues sobbing during the journey. Ford's wife suggests that food and rest might help her forget. The next morning, the slaves are introduced to Tibiats, a cruel overseer, and Chapin, Ford's overseer. Tibiats sings a mocking song, warning the slaves against escaping, as they toil in their labor. They continue chopping timber, and encounter a small group of native people, with whom, they briefly share a break. Solomon notices a stringed instrument, reminiscent of his own violin. 
The next day, Solomon, going against Clemens' advice, suggests to Ford a novel idea, to transport lumber via the river. Tibiats is condescending, but Ford is impressed with Solomon's idea, and agrees. The plan succeeds, embarrassing Tibiats, and Ford rewards Solomon with a violin. Meanwhile, Eliza mourns the loss of her children in the slave quarters, causing frustration for Solomon. Solomon and Eliza debate survival under Ford's seemingly decent treatment. Eliza argues that Ford must know, Solomon isn't a slave, but does nothing to free him, giving Solomon pause. Eventually, Eliza is sold off, because Ford's wife can't stand the noise. In the following days, Tibiat seeks petty revenge on Solomon, leading to a confrontation. Solomon fights back, gaining the upper hand, but Chapin intervenes, warning Tibiats not to run, and promising Ford will resolve it. Later, Tibiats gathers a group, to lynch Solomon for fighting him. They prepare to hang him, but Chapin returns, scaring them off. Solomon is left hanging on tiptoes, as punishment. Slaves seem indifferent, with one woman, secretly bringing him water. Hours later, Ford cuts the rope, saving Solomon, but decides to sell him to Epps, a brutal plantation owner, known for beatings. Epps reinforces his ownership through a Bible passage. The next day during cotton picking, Solomon's yield is below average, leading to lashes. Patsy, an exceptional worker, exceeds everyone, drawing Epps' fascination. Epps praises her, creating tension with his wife. Epps forces the slaves into an impromptu dance, and when his wife throws a decanter at Patsy, scarring her, she demands Epps sell Patsy. However, Epps refuses, claiming he would send his wife away, before parting with Patsy. Mistress Epps sends Solomon to the store with a list, and warns him not to read it. On the way, he contemplates escape but stumbles upon a lynching, breaking his spirit. He continues to the store, where he devises a plan, to take spare sheets for crafting a letter. Later, Epps sends him to a neighboring plantation, owned by Shaw, where Patsy is visiting. Solomon convinces Patsy to return with him, but Epps, jealous, interprets it as a sexual advance. After a drunken chase, Mistress Epps intervenes. That night, Epps rapes Patsy, and Mistress Epps cruelly slashes her face. Patsy pleads with Solomon to strangle her and dispose off her body, unable to bear Epps's abuse and Mistress Epps's torments. Solomon refuses. Epps's cotton crops are devastated by insects, prompting him to lend his slaves to a judge. This brings us back to the opening scene, where Solomon is cutting sugar cane. The judge notices his skill and recommends him for a music gig at a neighbor's party. Solomon can keep his earnings. The party reminds him of his past life as a free man, drawing poignant parallels. The party comes to an end, and Solomon returns to Epps's farm, greeted by the sight of Patsy's bloodied eye, indicating ongoing torment. With the cotton crop harvested, it's back to the fields. A white laborer, named Armsby, joins them, picking to get back on his feet. Despite his low yield, he avoids the whipping, the other slaves endure. In the quarters, he tends to Solomon's wounds, and shares his own story, appearing decent and sympathetic. Solomon decides to trust Armsby with a letter to secure his freedom, giving him his party earnings, and swearing him to secrecy. Armsby promises to deliver the letter in two days. That night, Epps takes Solomon outside, revealing Armsby broke his word, and told Epps everything. Fortunately, Armsby revealed his story, before Solomon gave him the letter. Thinking fast, Solomon flips the story on Armsby, painting him as a liar seeking favor for a job. Epps buys the story, sparing Solomon. Later, Solomon burns the letter, watching his hopes of freedom turn to ashes. Some time later, a team of workers, including a northerner, named Bass, with anti-slavery views, is building a structure. They engage in discussions that clash with Epps's pro-slavery beliefs, catching Solomon's interest. Later, Epps is furious about Patsy, thinking she ran away. He threatens violence against all the women, but she has only visited Shaw's plantation for soap, denied by Epps's wife. Patsy asserts her worth, and the right to be clean. Epps, angered by his wife's arguments, orders Patsy to be tied to the whipping post. Unable to carry out the punishment himself, Epps cravenly forces Solomon to do it. Initially trying to be gentle, Solomon is pushed, to increase severity by Mistress Epps. Epps, holding a gun to Solomon's head, 
threatens to kill every slave he sees, unless Patsy is whipped harder. Faced with an unthinkable choice, Solomon inflicts harsher blows, accompanied by a mist of blood. After a pause, Epps takes over, brutally whipping Patsy, until her flesh is torn, and she collapses. Solomon finds himself alone with Bass, the hired hand, and they engage in conversation. Learning that Bass is from Canada, Solomon demonstrates convincing knowledge of the country. Bass asks about Solomon's well-traveled background, and Solomon reveals the dire circumstances of his life. Bass comes to believe Solomon's story, and sympathizes with the injustice. As they continue working, Solomon takes a chance, and asks Bass to write letters to his friends in Saratoga. Bass agrees, but when the work is finished, he leaves. A lingering shot on Solomon, suggests uncertainty, about whether Bass kept his word, and tears in his eyes indicate a potential sense of betrayal. Later, a group of men is seen tilling soil and planting seeds. A carriage arrives, at the Epps plantation, with an official-looking man, the sheriff, calling out for Platt. Solomon. Solomon answers and approaches the sheriff, who asks him questions, and gestures to another man in the carriage, Mr. Parker, a shop owner, and Solomon's friend, from Saratoga. With minimal prompting, the sheriff is convinced, and Solomon rushes to embrace his friend. Epps is enraged, and makes empty threats, but the sheriff dismisses them. Parker helps Solomon into the carriage, and as he leaves, Patsy calls out to him. Solomon leaps from the carriage, to embrace her one last time. As he departs, Patsy collapses in grief. Solomon is carried home, and outside his door, he appears overwhelmed at being delivered from his nightmare. Upon entering, he sees his family, now 12 years older. Tears flow as they gather around him, welcoming him home. His daughter has married, and named their son, Solomon Northup. A series of title cards explain, that Solomon attempted to sue his kidnappers but failed. He became an abolitionist, and aided many runaways in achieving their freedom. So, have you ever thought about the true cost of freedom? Twelve Years a Slave, is not just a movie, it's a visceral journey that will make you question, reflect, and appreciate the strength of the human spirit. With that said, thanks for watching, and until next time, remember, every story, no matter how painful, has the power to inspire change.